spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of Pasta Time with the Scariest Podcast. Woo! We're the Scariest Podcast. <laughs> What'd you call us? <laughs> We're the Scariest Podcast. I'm Robin Grace, this is Sam Diaz, Hello. and we are indeed the Scariest Podcast. And today, we are doing something where, uh, you know, every other week, we read creepy pastas. Adam's going to tell us what creepy pastas are, and then I'm going to get into our first one. Indeed. So creepy pastas are the wonderful stories that you can go and find on the internet. Uh, there's a bunch of different communities like Creepypasta. In addition, there's stuff like the SCP Foundation and also uh, our very own Spooky Friends community that send in uh, fictional short horror stories. Uh, and these episodes are dedicated to reading those because they're some of our favorite things to read. A lot of you folks out there recommend stories like, hey, I really like this one or have stories of your own that you send in like I would love to hear that read on the podcast. Um, so that is essentially what a pasta time is. So we're going to be reading four creepy pastas today. Uh, I'm going to be reading, let me see if I remember, My Haunting Past is right in front of me, so I know that one. Um, and Julia Laguerre, I think is how you say this one. Robin, what are you going to be reading tonight? I'm going to be reading Mommy Sleeps in the Basement and the, uh, Quiet Sky. Cool. So. I actually checked out A Quiet Sky today. When I was reading, I was like, pretty fucking intense. I was like, I think I'm going to go with something a little bit more lighthearted. Wait, should Robin, I read that one first? Robin then? messaged me and she was like, I think I'm going to read a quiet sky. I was like, okay, cool. That's perfect. Because I picked ones that complement that one. So. Uh, okay. I think it'll be good as third. Smack dab in the middle. All right. Because so, cool. you're going to go first, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I will pass over the sticks to you and take it There away. are no sticks on the mouse. It's something that you call your controller. Analog sticks. Yeah, whatever. I'm giving her my mouse. All right. So this first one I'm going to read titled Mommy Sleeps in the Basement. Uh, it goes, or it begins. Speak louder, please. I put my hand up next to my ear from the back of the room, signaling that she would need to raise her voice. She took a deep breath. I could see anxiety turning her cheeks beet red as strands of blonde hair began to fall out of the same nappy ponytail she wore every day. There was something about her so familiar, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. With her face glued to the paper, too afraid to make eye contact, she quickly sputtered out. Hi, my name is Paisley Jackson. So, sputtering out. Wait, I gotta read it faster. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Paisley Jackson, and this is my poem called My Family. I imagine that's how fast she read it. <laughs> Paisley was a shy little girl. In fact, she was one of the quietest students I ever had in my 10 years of teaching, which I guess, being the youngest of 11, will do that to anyone. Holy, what? <laughs> okay, surprisingly... Don't we know someone who's the youngest of 11? Yeah, my aunt is the youngest of 11. Uh, no, she's not the youngest. Did yeah, she, she is the youngest. She's did the youngest she write of this? Oh, <gasps> shit. Oh, shit. Okay. Secret life we just uncovered. <laughs> Surprisingly, she was very smart, unlike the rest of her siblings, who were dumber than a box of rocks. That's a lot of kids okay. to have to have 10 dumb kids, man. I'm just saying. As a, a teacher, right, does, does any teacher out there say that all of her siblings were a box, were like dumber than a box of rocks? Would you say that? I'm sure that? there's teachers out there that would call their students that for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lord, the Jackson kids were such a headache, except for Paisley, of course. I just wish I could have given her more opportunities to improve her future. Don't get me wrong, I tried to help Paisley. I really did. I gave her clothes, food, and even had funds lined up for her. But living dirt poor in a shack out in the middle of the desert was a bad hand to be dealt in life. Besides, no matter what I did, it wouldn't have made a difference. Everyone knows that the cycle of poverty is almost impossible to break. I crossed my legs, pen in hand, preparing for yet another bland story about a family I'd never get to meet. If you've ever worked with underprivileged kids, you'd know that guardian involvement is quite rare. When it came to interest in their daughter's education, Paisley's parents were no exception. And this is Paisley telling her poem now, okay? So, I have two mommies, one named Betty who can make good spaghetti, I call her mom. She's the one that's married to my dad, Tom. Then there's one named Claire with pretty yellow hair. I call her mommy. Dad calls her his project, his hobby. That's fucked up. <laughs> it is fucked up. All right. So now it's back to the teacher's uh, inner know. thoughts. Yeah. So being smack dab in the middle of Utah, I've seen hundreds of polygamous families. So this didn't strike me as odd. Besides, even though polygamy is illegal, I try to keep my nose in my own business. Mom takes care of us all. She can do that because she's so tall. 
Mommy wears a pretty silver bracelet. She wears it because she's so famous. Okay. Wouldn't be the first time I saw kids coming up with stories about celebrity parents to add excitement to their ordinary lives. I just didn't expect it to come from Paisley. Mommy has me and Tommy. He's one of my older brothers. Mom is a lot older. She has all the others. I cringed. That meant that one of Paisley's mothers had given birth to nine children. I couldn't imagine going through that many pregnancies. Neither could I. Unless they're like an octomom, then it's just two pregnancies. The second <laughs> one was probably way easier. Dad says me and Tommy are a gift from God. He'll never hit us with a rod. His pride and joy is Tommy, but he says the only person he truly loves is Mommy. That's pretty messed up. This is getting, like, terrifying. I looked up from my grade book with the line about a rod catching my attention. However, this wasn't the first time one of my students had accidentally reported abuse. Truth is, CPS picks and chooses who they want to help. Mom is having another baby. She's mad at Dad. She and Dad want to name it Daisy. Mommy can't have no more kids. Her last one died of SIDS. Wow. Shifting in my seat, I scribbled down a note reminding myself to deliver my daughter's old baby clothes to the Jackson's shack. As a mother myself, I know babies can be expensive. Dad says she did it on purpose because she wanted to run off and join the circus. Mom says it wasn't her fault. I promised to keep that secret in the me and her vault. I shook my head in sadness. How could someone blame a grieving mother for something she couldn't control? Mommy was the one Dad chose. He watched all of her school shows. They were joined in the night. Daddy says inside her is a lot of fight. Mom is just a cover. Dad doesn't really love her. (laughs) What the fu- Oh my god. I threw my hand up, a gesture meaning stop. I had taught my students, but Paisley didn't look up. She continued to read, oblivious to my disappointed frown. Obviously, one of her siblings put her up to this as a joke. Mommy says she needs to get out. She wants to show me what life is all about. Dad gets mad. It's his biggest pet peeve. Mommy is sad. She just wants to leave. I forget that this is a poem. Mommy sings me her favorite song. Mom says dad's head is wired wrong. Wow. Shaking my head, I sighed. Another child with so much potential and such a kind heart was stuck in the middle of a lover's quarrel that didn't even involve her. Last birthday, I wanted to take mommy to see her favorite basketball team. Mom made me a cake with frosted buttercream. I got to go see the Knicks, but dad said he made a mistake he couldn't fix. I wonder what the mistake was. Nothing is the same anymore. I don't know why for sure. Now dad cries at night alone. He asks God, what have I done? To mom, he no longer tends. He hopes the baby will make amends. Okay, so he slept with the mom, right? And made a kid because the mom wanted another kid. I don't know. Keep going. Maybe the answer will be revealed (laughs) in the story. (laughs) That's true. Paisley rose her head with a smile, looking for me, uh, looking for my approval. Although I was appalled at the inappropriateness of her poem, I didn't want to break her spirits. She clearly was very proud of it, and scolding her for something that wasn't her wrongdoing was just going to send that little girl back into her shell that I'd been trying to break for months. So instead, I clapped, making the rest of the class, who were too young to understand the gravity of the situation, applauded too. Mrs. June, I brought a picture of Mommy for extra credit. It's got one more part of the poem. Can I show the class? Oh, geez. Okay. I nodded my head, thinking there couldn't possibly be any details worse than what she already presented. Paisley reached into the front pocket on her old, worn-out, hand-me-down dress, pulling out an old, aging photo. She flipped the flaking picture around, displaying it as if it were her most prized possession. My blood ran cold. I finally figured out why Paisley looked so familiar to me. In what seemed to be a school photograph smiling ear to ear, exactly like Paisley, 
was a young woman by the name of Claire Daisy. She was a high school student popular for her ability to gain the lead in every school play, and they'd gone missing without a trace 12 years prior. She was last seen leaving theater practice one night, but then she just vanished. No sign of a struggle, no witnesses, no evidence, no body, nothing. Her case was covered on every news station in Utah for a while because of how peculiar it was until people lost interest. Paisley happily continued. I was so in shock I couldn't stop her as she read off the back of the picture. There's one thing I don't understand and maybe you'll have the answer at hand. If dad's love for mommy will never sway, why did he treat her that way? Mom lays her head on a nice soft bed, but mommy sleeps in the basement under a big slab of cement. What the fuck? So that's the end, right? Yeah, that's the end. So the guy kidnapped this girl and keeps her in like some sort of prison in the basement that he covers with a slab of cement. Or he killed her and now I took this she's as she's cement. like his slave, like how they like this is like Elizabeth Smart situation where it's like a kidnap disappeared style thing. I think she tried to escape and he killed her. And cuz cuz he was saying that he made a really big mistake. Cuz in the poem she said he made a really big mistake and yeah. hoped that the baby would make amends. I think the mom uh, and the fact that it's sleeps in the basement under a big slab of I cement. I get that part, but at the same time it seems just too obvious for that to just be like Oh, he buried her in the basement under a big slab of cement. Like, I get that. Like, to me, it just seems more like the movies where you see the people that, like, dug out a completely different room underneath their house. Yeah. Where they keep people trapped. Um, But I don't know. It could be either way. I just, it's really just obvious if it and boring if it's like, oh, you know, he killed her, she's dead type of thing. Like, the idea that he kidnapped her, decided this person was someone he was going to keep and have kids with. Um, It's like, well, how would you, how would you ever do that by keeping them, like, in the house unless they were living in the basement, you know? I he think kept her around long enough to have two kids with her. Where the fuck did he keep her? Uh, very true. She probably was kept in the basement. Um, but who knows? Who Whoever wrote this story, let us know. They probably interpreted um, it as she's dead, and I'm just trying to read more into it. Because in my head, it's like, if this guy took this chick 12 years ago and had two kids with her. Yeah. And it's like a polygamous story where you find out, like, oh, this is the kid of the girl who was kidnapped. It's like... There's a lot of logistics that go into kidnapping someone and keeping them and keeping it quiet for 12 years. Yeah. So not sure, but overall, pretty good story. Yeah. Good stuff. It's really intense. Yeah. <laughs> really intense. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move into my first creepypasta of the show. This one's kind of short, which I'm happy about because shorter are like sometimes more impactful. It's this genre called flash fiction that I really fucking dig. And it's like try and make the most impactful, very, very short story. And this one kind of feels like flash fiction. It's called My Haunting Past. It goes like this. I've always had trouble sleeping at night. Noises have disturbed me my whole life. I found out years ago that I have hypersensitive hearing picking up all sorts of background noises. You're a superhero. They couldn't fix it. Only recommend the obvious techniques to mask the problem. Not that I hadn't tried these already. Earmuffs, listening to music, and even things like meditation. None of it worked. In fact, it seemed to make it worse. It made her more desperate. I hear her most nights. No one else can. Why does she only come to me? There's always the dread of lying there each night in the dark silence, anticipating when she will come and when I will hear her again. She usually likes to wait until I'm drifting to sleep so that I jump back to my senses in fright to the sound of her there. Most of the time it begins with a faint crying. She tells me that she, quote, wants to make it end. I know she's getting closer to getting me, and some nights I can even feel her cold breath in my ear. It's fucked up. I can sense when she is lying close beside me in the darkness, staring at me, and sometimes she whispers things like, It's only me, right into my ear. She's toying with me, like a cat does to a helpless insect before killing it. The thing is, I could never see her, but it slowly felt like she was becoming more real. The doctor later informed me that I suffer from schizophrenia. I have been taking medication for a long time, but it wasn't really working. It just made me feel more helpless. It was difficult for a girl as young as me to deal with this. At least, now I could accept that she wasn't real. It was all in my head, and there was nothing real to be afraid of. 
That was until last night. She's about to pop off. I hate you. Last night, her presence felt more real than ever. I could hear her whisper, feel the air on my neck, and even smell her breath. It was all too realistic to handle. I got so scared that I fell back into my old habit of running through the darkness of the house into my mother's bed to sleep beside her where I felt safe. Now that I was older, I knew she was hoping I had grown out of this phase, although I had only stopped doing it because it made her sad, and I didn't want her to be disappointed in me anymore. She was all I had. If I had the choice, I would be in there beside her every night without fail. I knew my mother had been awoken by me, probably more saddened that I had reverted to old ways when she thought the medication had been helping me. But it wasn't helping. I had just lied all this time to keep her happy and let her sleep in peace. Wow. I curled up in bed beside her and began to sob quietly. My mom looked uncomfortable from the noise I had made and began stirring under the sheets, so I whispered into her ear, It's only me. She sat up abruptly, looking anxious. In the darkness, I saw her reach over for her cell phone and begin to dial a number. I noticed on the screen that she was calling the doctor. The voices I used to hear, she said, they're back. What the fuck? That's the end. What? Yep. So was she the main character or was she the alternate personality the entire time? This is like Was some... she the voice in someone's head? Have or you ever watched the others? Or was this person all of a sudden, did they switch at some point? You know, because she started as being the person that was trying to subdue the voice. Yeah. And the whole, like, it's only me, like, loops back around at the end. So I really liked that one. I was like, for a single page story, that was excellent. I really enjoyed wow. it. Wow. Okay. Good stuff. Not, was she but... buried under the concrete slab or is she living down there and she's just, you know, kidnapped? She's got to feed her some fish heads. I, yeah, a bucket of fish heads once a week. That's all you need. Uh, I, that one's really good. Um, it's, it, to me, it gives me the others vibes. That sh- that movie I've never with watched Nicole all the Kidman. way through. I know the twist. So yeah, don't want to ruin it for anyone out there. It's okay. That movie's like 20 years old. You can ruin it. They're the it. ghosts. Yeah. They're the ghosts Ooh, the whole time. Okay. She killed her if kids. you haven't seen it, then that's on you. That movie is so effing old. Um, but yes, it gives me the others vibes where the entire movie you're watching this family and they're thinking that they're haunted. And then at the end of the movie turns out they're the ones haunting the people in that home the entire time. Uh, so that's what I get off of this. Also, the name of the story is My Haunting Past, not Haunted Past. So I mm-hmm. thought that was interesting. I looked back on that. I was like, hmm, this is a chin scratch. I'm going to go ahead and read this one on the show. I think that one's credited to just someone like named Jake. They didn't have a, a full name or anything like Last that. Last name, so. Paul. <laughs> Good stuff. Fuck you. <laughs> I hate you so much. So before we move into our next story, we are going to take a really quick commercial break. And we're back. I'm going to get into my final story of the episode. We still have one after this, so stay tuned after this story. It is titled The Quiet Sky, and it begins like this. It started when we called out to the stars. Into the darkness, we felt so small, tumbling through vast emptiness while clinging to the skin of the world, and without a single reason why. We were curious, yes, but ultimately I think we were just terribly frightened, and we were young, so very young. We were children, and like a lonely lost child, we did the only thing we could think to make it stop. We did what we thought we had to do to make the universe make sense. We called for help. For years, we scanned the sky for a sign. We sent signals to the stars in the darkness and beyond. Are we alone? But the skies were quiet always so quiet, leaving us to our own makings. But crying children never cease, and neither did we. We sent calls into every corner of space for decade after decade. We refused to believe no one was out there. They had to be. Yet for some unknown reason, they never answered us. Everyone remembers when that changed. They think it responded to the Arecibo message from 1974. The response to the Arecibo message was received almost three months ago in two separate parts. The first part of the message was received at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory in California. The Allen Telescope Array picked up what sounded like static interference that continued on for over an hour. It consisted of unintelligible screeching and buzzing sounds that continued without pause for the whole hour. The meaning of this message was never discovered, if it had one. The only thing we knew was that the signal's origin came somewhere in the Hercules constellation near Messier 13. 
As soon as that signal stopped, the real message began. We made contact that day, and we were asked a question. Who is there? So, when I read this story and I got to that part, I read it like, who is there? Okay. Well, you can use that voice then. No, no, you do yours. <laughs> yours just sounds so sweet. That's all. Who's there? Like, Who is oh my there? God. <laughs> Oh my god, space besties. <laughs> Solar neighbors, no way. It came not through the radios, but as a voice. A voice inside all of our heads. It asked the question to all of us. I heard it, my wife heard it, the young heard it, and the old heard it. Even the deaf heard it. Everyone everywhere heard this voice whisper that question in their heads in every language on earth. I remember it almost too clearly. It asked in that familiar yet undescribable voice that's always there in my mind. It was like one of my own thoughts had gone rogue and had decided to speak directly to me. The world seemed to stop as everyone listened for what came next. Where are you? (laughs) These, These aliens are fucking weird. Okay. The heavy questions seemed to linger in our minds for hours afterwards, and then for days, and then for weeks. That day changed everything. Of course it's asking where we are. It wants to come and murder us I was really hoping one of these questions would be, are you a god? (laughs) Are you afraid of the dark? Okay. There were the doubters from the very beginning, and the holy ones, the quote-unquote holy ones, who claimed that God had spoken to all of us that the time to repent was now. As crazy as people seem like in movies when they start like getting way too serious about stuff, I think if everyone in the world had a telepathic message delivered to them in every language that existed, that would kind of be the one time I'd be like, they might have a point. (laughs) There were those who claimed they'd heard nothing, and those who'd claimed that the aliens had given them their own secret messages— And, of course, there were those who truly believed that we had been contacted for the first time by an extraterrestrial race like us, one ready to communicate, ready to lead us out of the dark. We were wrong. We never made contact with alien life, at least nothing comprehensible or discernible to human understanding. The stars are vast, and in their vastness, our voices had touched the ears of something truly incomprehensible, something hungry and malevolent. The Voice. Is this about the TV show? I was going to say, I've never watched that show. I feel like I should have known. We realized our mistake when the ground started to groan. Beneath our feet, everywhere, the ground seemed to moan. Uh... (laughs) What the fuck? You're on my skin. (laughs) We are the virus. The muffled sounds shook through the dust and dirt below us. No one knew what was causing it, at least not until the calls started coming in. The graveyards were screaming. All at once, the dead had started screaming. Every deceased man, woman, and child was turning in their graves. All the animals did so too. Every dog, every cat, everything that had ever walked this earth. The cries of ancient whales shook the seas and the shrill screeching of birds echoed in the forests. The caskets shook and the morgues howled. The voices stopped together in an instant, leaving the world in an amplified silence. In their absence, a new sound filled the air. The voice returned. I hear you. It came as a whisper from behind, an ominous yet oddly playful presence that felt so close but was truly still so far away. It let us breathe in silence for a minute before it made us a promise. It was a promise we all knew to be true. I am coming. (laughs) Fucking gross. The voice was gone and the air was again filled with screams. This time they were from the living. After the voice had gone, we were left to our own devices. Millions panicked, and rightfully so, as chaos took hold of the streets. Many would die in the violence and the gunfire of that night. They would be known as the raptured before long, and the rest of us were the condemned. We could only wait. The screaming dead was only the first of the side effects that we felt as the voice approached. The closer it got, the more we felt. 
That first night after the screaming, we noticed the stars bleed for the first time. A section of the western sky had turned black blacker than the night. It was only truly visible because of the ring of stars around it. The light from those stars had turned red, and they seemed to bleed across the sky like food coloring dropped into water. Their light swirled and flowed all around the edge of some unseen mass. I knew then that I was staring into the face of the voice. Our scientists claimed that nothing was there and that their radar and scans always came up empty. Their telescopes could see nothing but darkness in the section of space. However, the proof was right in front of us as every night that ring of darkness got wider and more stars bled in the sky. We watched it come. <laughs> as each night passed, the black spot would widen and more stars would distort and bleed around it. During the day, a new hell would greet us. The side effects worsened. The day always brought something new. I'm sure most of what happened will go untold and unknown. The animals started disappearing, all of them. No tracks, traces, or bodies were left behind. Pets would run away, some violently so. They all retreated, never to be seen again. The forests were left abandoned, the oceans empty, the air was left silent. The world left seemed empty and lonely. They left like water receding from the shore just before the tsunami breaks. One day, about two weeks ago, scientists tried to talk to the voice again. They hoped, perhaps, to reason with it. They told it about what was happening on our world and asked it questions. The scientists begged. It didn't speak. When asked why, the voice sent a response. The next night, the skies lit up with streaks of fire. It was alight for hours, blazoned with orange and red. We didn't realize the effects until the next day when the televisions turned to static and the telephones refused to work. We had sat watching as all the satellites were knocked out of the heavens. After that, reports became rumors and rumblings, sanity, a thing of the past. The air chilled and weighed us down. The voice was nearly here and everyone felt it. It rained for a week after the satellites fell. The rain was salty and mired with an unknown filth that turned the grass black. Maybe the satellites tracked something back in with them when they hit the sky. No one knew for sure. All we know is that it fell from clouds, black as charcoal that blotted out the sun, like liquid ash. Darkness fell upon us for days. I'm pretty sure they're going through a lot of the plagues uh, and seals that are talked about in Revelations. Really? So, yeah. Hmm. I don't know any of those. The dead rising from the grave. Oh, shit. Stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Today I learned. When the clouds went away, the skies were empty. There were no clouds, yet the sky hung low and gray. If the sun was anywhere in the sky, it never made itself known. Even it had abandoned us. Each day grew slowly darker and darker until night and day became almost the same. Some people would claim later that they'd seen things in the dark. Creatures with gangly limbs and crooked faces lurking in the corner of their vision. They were tall, white creatures that looked molted or rotten through their transparent skin. Appearances would last for just a second or two before vanishing without a trace. Some believed this was the first step in the aliens' invasion, but the rest of us didn't know what to think. We just knew that it was nothing that simple or benign. They must have been hallucinations, just more madness to endure, but ultimately as harmless as anything else, as harmless as the screams of the dead, the missing animals, and the dying sky. Appearances slowly increased in duration and number. I think everyone saw them once at least, but I don't think a single person would ever guess why they were truly there. They never touched nor spoke to anyone, and they certainly never harmed anyone. Most who got good looks at them described them as mournful or sorrowful looking. Some even claimed that the creatures watched over them at night, and others even claimed that it seemed as if the creatures were sorry for them. One claimed to have even seen one prostrate upon the ground, hands clasped above its head. He said it was praying for us. Uh, to prostrate is when you kneel in front of the uh, altar, the altar thing, right? Some form of worship, yeah. Yeah. Um, prayer was no help. The churches and places of worship that had divided us for so long failed to bring hope to any in the end. The voice let them pray and beg for a while, but just days ago, the voice ended it all. 
No one questioned how, for at this point, nothing that happened surprised anyone anymore. But on the final day, all books of worship burned. Every last Bible, Quran, everything. People rushed to their centers of faith but found no solace. The churches and temples had suffered the same fates, if not worse. People were left abandoned by their greatest hopes. There were rumors of churches all over the world with walls formed from the bodies of those who sought refuge. They were merged to the walls, stuck to them like flies in a trap. They died, still pleading for hope, but they were beyond God's help. The rest of us had learned to stop begging. We waited. The final message came. From beyond the sky, it fell upon us. The voice echoed, and it spoke the simple truth. I am here. There is a darkness beyond the horizon, the likes of which I doubt has ever been seen. It brings with it the screams of countless souls, and it moves fast. The stars are dying now, and I know they'll never be seen again. The light is dying so fast. I leave this not as a warning. No, it's far too late for that. Instead, consider this the last realization, the last humanity will ever know. For we used to wonder whether or not we were alone and lost, but never whether or not we were safe and hidden. The universe is infinite, and our understanding was significantly more finite. We should never have beckoned to the darkness. Instead, we should have clung to the light and closed our eyes every time we were turned to the void. As the final minutes approach, I hold one final truth to be certain. I now know why the skies were always so quiet. Because the shit was out there. The truth is <laughs> out there. I don't want to believe. So- I read this one. I didn't read it start to finish. I definitely read bits and pieces of it here and there. I read the start. I read the middle. I read the end. That sounds like I read all of it. Um, But I didn't read a lot of the different pieces of it. That said, the reason I chose not to read this one, one, is because it's fucking crazy. Uh, And I figured I'd pick it for a a day where I was going to do something a little bit more heavy. Um, Robin took it, and I thought, perfect, because now I can take ones that are a little bit lighter. Um, That said, when it comes to creepypastas and these sorts of fictions... I always read these with the mindset of this is supposed to trick me into thinking it's real. And like this obviously didn't happen because we're all still here. Yeah. And who the fuck would find it? You know, like, yeah, unless it's like alternate universe, somehow it fell at someone's feet, something like that, something weird. But if you try to add that stuff into the story, it just wouldn't make any sense. So it's not bad by any means. But where I found it being creepypasta made me think like, I could never think that this actually happened because it's obviously something that would be the end of the world. I take this as one of those movies that we watch where it, it like, uh, what is that? War of the Worlds type shit, you know? And it's not that someone's finding this. It's like you're going along with them through this journey as they write it. You know what I mean? I guess, yeah. Yeah. For me, this sounds to me like what would happen in the movie The Fifth Element if Bruce Willis wasn't there. Because, like, it's this giant thing in space that's essentially a void, you know? And when they try to identify it, even though the fifth element's set in the future, and this is all from the beginning, so if you're like, don't spoil it for me, it's like 30 years old and you suck. But (laughs) let us ruin all those movies for you. At some point, Bilbo Baggins tells the president of Earth. um, Bilbo Baggins? It is Bilbo Baggins. um, Because they're trying to figure out what it is when it shows up. Oh, shit, you're right. And Bilbo Baggins tells them, like, this thing, you can't identify it because it chooses not to be identified. You know, yeah. and it also speaks to people through their minds. Um, and spoiler alert, in the end, um, when it looks like it's going to be defeated, it moves to Earth. It's like, OK, I'm just going to kill everyone. Then bye. And everyone's like, welcome to Earth. Welcome to Earth. And they punched in the face and Will Smith smokes a cigar. Still never and that's seen the it. end of the 5th of July element, Independence Day 5. So not really. But, you know, when I when I was going through this, and when you were reading it, too, I was like, there's definitely certain parts of it that I feel were inspired by, like, other disaster apocalypse movies mm-hmm. and parts of Revelations picked out and put in. I think it's written incredibly well, though. Yeah. You know, it's a really solid idea of, like, should we really be asking if anything is out there? Because that is something that we've absolutely done. There's a program called SETI that searches for intelligent life in the universe. It looks for signals that could be generated by any sort of civilization. That's horrific. And we have been pumping out messages into the space. Haven't we, like, sent the blood space. into space? Here's the thing. 
Um, we've sent certain things out in space, absolutely. We've been sending out signals into random spots of space. We received a response at one point. We just could never decipher it. So oh, fuck. Haven't talked about that on the show Shut yet. Shut the what? That is 100% true. We, we, we got a no, signal fuck, back and we still no. don't know what it was. Mm -mm. People think it was like some sort of thing that must not have come from a civilization, but there's a lot of folks in the scientific community that's like, we don't know the fuck it was and there's no way we could ever is figure it, it out. Is it possible it could have just been some waves from another planet not necessarily someone speaking i'll cover it next but, week i'll oh, tell you that but. and we'll go over it um so there's one other thing i was going to say about this and i've kind of forgotten it now god Aliens. damn it robin getting all scared um fuck you say something now because i can't think of it uh this is about the story you just read come on <laughs> participate in this thing called scarish no i thought it was a really good story i, I thought it was really well written i think like aliens are a thing i think extraterrestrials do exist out there um i just finished watching um a documentary series on space called the universe and space is really a, a very hard to understand thing it's so incredibly vast and there's still stuff out there we don't understand like the idea of dark matter we still haven't been able we still haven't been able to create um dark matter ourselves right i saw a documentary called angels and demons mm, where they God. created antimatter and then it's not the same and then ewan mcgregor <laughs> um, i ewan remember McGregor. what i was gonna say actually so what i was gonna say is there's a quote i cannot remember who it's by but it says that there are only two distinct possibilities one is that we are alone in this universe and the other is that we are not both are equally terrifying uh, and when you think about that, like, yep, that's 100% fucking true. Either think way we, you slice it. I don't think we're alone, though. I don't believe that we are um, the only living beings in the universe. I understand that we, where we are located in our solar system, um, it's very unique. is very unique. It's somehow perfectly suited to sustain life, right? But that's our life. Correct. It could be other plant. It's like it's like Think that about stupid fucking episode of Rick and Morty where his whole that one alien's whole planet was made of cocaine. Their yeah. whole atmosphere is made of cocaine. It was heroin. It's like hair. It's whatever. It doesn't matter uh, because that's it could be another planet's air. The is made best of way I can else. put it, man, is like think about fish. They don't breathe air. They breathe water. You know. And they, that's just on our planet. They now they decide the, they get oxygen out of water, but what they breathe in through their gills, they will suffocate if they breathe air. You know. And if you think about that, and think about the fact that other planets exist in infinite amounts out there, it is possible that life somewhere else exists. The thing I think where people get wrapped <laughs> up in the debate is whether or not there's intelligent life, you know? Yeah. Sentient, intelligent life that could pose a threat. Um, and it's one of those things where who knows that there's just some sort of giant world-eating entity like Dark Galactus here. Uh, that we could accidentally make contact Dormammu. with. See, I was really hoping that in that story, something would come back around like that shrieking that came through the first yeah, time yeah, yeah. was someone warning us like, shut the fuck up for like an hour. I, to me, the, the screeching I thought was that them controlling the dead on our planet and creating that sound. But it came from outer space. The yes. reply came from outer space. Yes. Well, so I thought to me was this thing controlled all our dead and was and brought these uh, beings back to life to create that sound so he can hear it somewhere in the universe or it could hear it somewhere in the universe and then follow that well sound. that's what it did to find us when the sound came from earth what i'm talking about is the beginning of the story when we send out the response and then the first thing we heard back was shrieking and like uh, a message uh, uh, sent uh, uh, to us not the okay. one that was clearly him just tracking oh us. Gotcha, gotcha gotcha i say him it whatever it could be whatever it wants to be no i thought it was like the first response we got back was like Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. It's like, you're going to get everyone killed. And then the next thing you know, all the stars winking out of yeah, existence. Yeah. I want to check the date on one that was written because Griffin McElroy put that in the first arc of Adventure Zone called Balance, where the stars start winking out. And it's uh, an example of a universe-eating entity coming to kill everyone. I think so. 2019. That was 2019? I think so. Fucking ripped off Griffin McElroy. Dial him up. I'm calling my boy Griffy Mac and let him know. So, anyways, that was really good. I'm really happy you picked it, Robin. Good stuff. Thanks. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move into my last and the last story of the show. This one's title is Julia Laguerre. I'm not sure if that's how you're supposed to say it, but hey, that's how I am saying it because, you know, literature, take your own interpretation, whatever. Goes like this. I used to say Hermione or Herm Hermione. I cannot wait for the Wheel of so. Time show to come out so we can finally have official pronunciations, even though there's a glossary that tells you how you're supposed to say some of these things. Did Harry Potter have a glossary? No, right? I never read Harry Potter, so I wouldn't know. Oh, fuck. Uh, that Sorry, said, we're going to go ahead and get started with this one. Goes like this. A few years ago, 
I was spending some time with friends exploring old, supposedly haunted places. Sounds like some of the spooky friends. <laughs> we were at the Adisto First Presbyterian Church where a girl named Julian Laguerre was buried in her family mausoleum in 1852. All right, all right. Y'all remember 1852? No, Shut I'm kidding. <laughs> People reported hearing unearthly screams time and time again, but never investigated the cause of it. It's because that void is coming. Fifteen years later... When they opened the door to the mausoleum to inter the next family member who had died, finding her corpse huddled in the corner next to the door, arms outstretched, as if still trying to find the exit. She's buried alive. 100. Gotta be buried alive. It's gotta be. Well, my friends thought it would be a funny idea to shut the giant stone door, in parentheses, which was originally open, behind me, and pick me up in the morning. The bastards left me there. I tried and tried, using all of my strength, but I couldn't budge it. It had taken four people to put it in place. In the dark, I resigned myself to the night ahead of me. Now, I normally don't frighten easily, but sitting there in the relatively small place, surrounded by a looming pressure that I couldn't begin to explain, the darkness itself seemed to try to consume me. From all around, it felt like weight was pressing against my skin, making even breathing hard. I sat in the dark for what must have been hours. Then, I heard the scratches. They were faint at first. I was sure it was my imagination, but soon they became more and more frantic as time passed. I huddled up in one of the corners farthest from the door and I tried to cover my ears, but nothing could stop the growing cacophony. This all may have lasted for a few minutes, but each second was an unbearable eternity. Then a loud scream echoed through the darkness. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It was a wail of unrestrained pain and fear. The scratching stopped. For the first time, I could distinctly make out the sound of a girl sobbing to herself. Right next to the door. The pitiful gasping of one without a shred of hope left. I felt such sorrow at that moment, such pain, that I think I forgot how to be afraid. In my heart, all her suffering seemed to resonate. Inexplicably, I found myself apologizing aloud for everything that had happened to her. Hell, a part of me wanted to reach out and feel for a body to hug, but I couldn't bring myself to do it for fear that I truly would find one. No. Side note. I might empathize. I might even apologize. There's no way I'm trying to get a fucking nope. skelly hug. No. I don't know whether or it's not she hug. heard me or was even aware of my presence. The sobbing continued, and I could again hear fingers against the stone slab that was the tomb door. No. I fell asleep at some point. How in the fuck did you fall asleep? Nope. I fell asleep at some point, which I felt was a merciful gift from the fates. Have you ever cried yourself to sleep? No. I don't think so. If I did, I can't remember it, so thank you, Brain, for blocking that out. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how long I was out, but I was woken by a loud and powerful thud as the door slammed against the ground outside. I could tell from the light gray outside that daybreak was near, so I must have slept for at least a few hours. I stumbled outside and went to a small, unlocked prayer house. I think previously it was a segregated mini-church, but regardless, I leaned against the door and waited nervously until my friends, in quotations... Yeah, because they are not friends if they did that to you. ...arrived. I approached them as they clustered around the fallen door. Two of them were kneeling next to it with faces of shock. There were bloody streaks covering the interior of the door, some with light scratches from fingernails, ugh, many without. I think now that she must have shrieked when they broke away from her hands, but I can't be sure. At first, they looked to me, then checked my hands, then nervously glanced at one another. I was rightfully pissed with them and told them every detail of what I remembered, wanting them to know what I had been put through. This is, again, where I deviate from the author because they would have had bloody faces if they would have come anywhere fucking near me after mm -hmm. locking me in this yep. place. Finally, after I grudgingly got into the car, we started to head back and someone spoke up. My friend said to me, we were afraid to say anything, but look at your face. I later found out that many times people had tried to permanently seal the entrance to the mausoleum, including enough heavy locks and chains that it would require heavy equipment to remove it, only to have it torn open with the door lying on the ground once more. What the f This was in the 1980s, the last attempt of many through the decades. It seemed like some force was ensuring that it was impossible to ever repeat the mistakes of the past. This is something I am understandably grateful for, but to this very day, I am chilled to the bone when I think of what happened that night. When I reached from the back seat and adjusted the rearview mirror, I saw that there was blood caked on my face, just like the streaks upon the stone slab, there were dark red lines on either side as if someone had gently cradled my face with torn fingers as I slept that night, feeling the warmth of another for the first time in over a hundred years. That's uh fucking terrifying. 
pretty scary. But at the same time, kind of like, oh, it's a prank gone wrong. The one thing when I was reading through the story the first time that I didn't like is how quickly it goes from like the history to my friends push me in the tomb. You know, where it's like, wait, okay, what's the time period? How long has it been? Is this set in the 1980s? Since you mentioned that, is this set in present day? And you're just referencing the 1980s when the chains are put up. Aside from that, I really did like this one. This feels like one of those things that your friends would tell you, like, you won't believe what happened to so-and-so's brother's sister's cousin, you know? Like, this sounds like an actual Something, local legend. Yeah, like an that urban would get passed legend. around yep. for sure. And I really appreciated that about it. So I enjoyed it. Hope you did too. Nice. I want to give a big shout out to all of the folks out there who have written the stories that we read tonight. Uh, we don't read off your name because a lot of times your names are not attached to these, but we do appreciate it. If you have a story that you would like us to read, you can message us and say, hey, I think you guys should read this one on Post Time. You'd really like it. Uh, or you can send your own short story of fiction to us. We would love to read it. Just send it to us. Let us know. It is a creepy pasta, so we know to put it on this particular episode. Pasta time at scariest.com. You can email pasta time at scariest.com. Hit us up on our website, scariest.com. Let us know it's a creepy pasta. Or you can message us on any of our social medias. Facebook is facebook.com slash scariest podcast. Twitter is at scariest pod. Instagram is at scariest podcast. Even if you're just going to say, like, hey, you should check out this creepy pasta. We love that sort of feedback. So send it our way. Robin, for folks who would like to donate to us, how can they do so? You can go to patreon.com slash scariest podcast. I actually, uh, those are monthly donations, different tiers. They start at a dollar. At a dollar, you get ad free. I actually just mailed out this season's rewards, which is a sticker and a keychain. The keychain features the Fresno Nightcrawlers. They look so freaking cool. They're so cute. I love those um, pants, <laughs> those ghostly puffy pants. pants. Uh, and yeah, if you're not into the monthly donation type thing, uh, you can go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash scariest podcast. Those are one-time donations. All your donations go to helping us upgrade our studio setup, kind of keep us going, uh, kind of keep us changing it up, right? Doing more stuff. Uh, let's just make designs. Let's just order merch, all that fun yes. stuff. So uh, helps us with our hosting fees. There's a lot of fees. Uh, and either way, <laughs> it really, really, really helps us. It yeah. does. So uh, thank you to everyone who already donates. And we would love it if you could go over to any of those places that Robin has told us about and sign up or send up a donation. So. Or share, just talk about us with your friends. Yeah. Tell uh, your friends, listen. Yeah. So other than that, keep on creeping on and we'll talk to you guys later. Uh, bye bye.